The second highest office in the Cursus Honorum was the Praetor. If you were lucky enough to be elected Praetor, you were officially a big shot in Rome. There were eight Praetors on any given year, which meant that competition was fierce. Most Questors never made it to Praetor, and had to be satisfied with their lifetime membership to the Senate, with virtually no legislative power. Praetors were essentially judges, and were responsible for adjudicating the Republic's laws. However, we need to shift our perspective a little bit if we really want to understand this. Ancient societies revered judges much more than we do today. The power to judge, or the power to determine right and wrong, or the power over life and death was usually within the king's authority. It was a big deal at the time that the Romans devolved this power to their elected representatives. If we traveled back in time and observed a Roman trial, we would actually find it pretty easy to follow. Our modern legal system is heavily influenced by the Roman one. The praetor, or judge, would preside over the trial, which would have a defending advocate and a prosecuting advocate. Many trials even had juries, which was another democratizing innovation that would have terrified monarchical societies at the time. Roman jurists, when it came time to vote, were given three wax tablets. One with an A for absolutio, or absolution. One with a C for condemnatio, or condemnation. And one with an N and an L for non liquid for situations where neither side proved their case. When it came time to decide, each jurist secretly slid one tablet into a voting container, after which the votes were counted and the defendant's fate was decided. One of the really important bits for preachers came at this point. If the defendant was condemned, the preacher got to unilaterally decide the punishment. He only had a few options. Fines, physical punishment, banishment from the city, or death. There was no organized prism system in ancient Rome. They had one small jailhouse which was run by literally three civil servants, but that was mostly just used as a holding area for executions. One big difference that would make Roman law unrecognizable to us today was the fact that it was a spectator sport. In a weird way, it kind of makes sense, because the two advocates and the judge would usually be famous politicians. In hyper-political Rome, if you were a fan, or an ally, or a client of a certain senator, you might want to go see him argue his big murder case, or you might just want to go for the fun. According to our sources, people got rowdy. There are a lot of accounts of audience participation during the trials. There was applauding and hissing. There was times when advocates would turn their backs to the jury and just play to the crowd. People would make jokes at the expense of the people on trial. And sometimes there would just be open fights in the crowd. It was crazy. Despite all of this, we should not gloss over the fact that the Romans were extremely proud of their legal system. It's why they held the praetors in such high regard. The Romans had a special term for the kind of pseudo-kingly power that the praetors wielded. They called it Imperium. But Imperium was a two-sided coin. Imperium also gave praetors the authority to command armies. Let's not get crazy here. Praetors were still subservient to consuls, and consuls were responsible for the defense of the Republic. But in a pinch, a praetor was seen as capable of commanding an army. Or, and this was much more common, they were seen as capable of acting as a consul's second-in-command. It turns out that the Romans, to whom jingoism was the norm, were highly motivated by this. One interesting thing to note here is that the Romans saw absolutely no distinction between political talent and military talent. In their eyes, a good judge would make a good general, and a good general would make a good legislator. This may explain their unusual propensity to award military commands to charismatic public speakers. But back to Imperium. Preachers had it and they were just itching to use it. The Preachership was the lowest rank on the Cursus Honor where, when the one year term of office was over, the office holder was eligible to be governor of a province. The selection process was entirely in the Senate's hands, so as you can imagine, a lot of the Praetor's time and energy was spent trying to position himself to get a good province. People generally used their time as governor to make back some of the money they had to spend to get there in the first place. Once in the provinces, away from the consuls, a governor exercised supreme military and judicial power with very little oversight. Bribes were traded freely, and an unscrupulous governor could easily make a fortune overnight. 
Also, as the head of the provincial military, there was plenty of money to be made through conquest. Commanders of armies generally kept about 20% of the spoils of war, which, it has to be said, included human beings. This is why rich, or exotic, or even rebellious provinces were preferred over boring ones. Now, imagine how Caesar felt during his year as consul when Cato successfully pushed a bill through the Senate stating that Caesar was to be given governorship over Italy so that he could take care of the bandit problem. It was humiliating. There was no money to be made in this. There was no glory, and there was no towns to capture. People started making jokes behind Caesar's back about how he was going to be governing flocks of sheep. Caesar was eventually able to secure another province for himself, but it took a lot of political maneuvering. Cato was an interesting guy. He was a hard-line, staunch conservative, and a key political opponent of Caesar. He's also pertinent to this video because he never rose to the level of consul. He died a lowly preacher, but he was still able to throw his weight around in the Senate and make enough of a difference where he made it into our history books. Preachers, unlike the offices under them, were actually able to make a difference in the Senate. Remember, speaking order in the Senate went like this. First, the presiding magistrate who called the Senate to order got to speak, which was usually a sitting consul. Then, the Princeps Senatus got to speak. Then, any other current consuls could speak. Then, any former consuls. Then the current preachers, followed by the ex-preachers. Then the current ediles, followed by the former ediles. Then of course the current questers, followed by the former questers. It was pretty rare that debate got below the former preachers, since there were obviously a lot of them. The writer Anthony Everett claims that Cicero didn't even make a speech supporting or opposing a piece of legislation until after he was elected preacher. Cato, as an influential former preacher, was able to mobilize the debate in opposition to Caesar in a way that an edile never could. In fact, a famous example of this happened again during Caesar's year as consul. The Roman Senate could only legally meet between sunup and sundown, because, you know, the Romans just loved rules. Caesar's big legislative agenda during his consulship was this giant land reform bill which was very generous towards military veterans, who happened to be Caesar's allies, and very expensive towards the state. During a Senate debate on this, Cato rose to speak and began filibustering, intending to speak until the sun went down and debate had to be suspended. Cato had pulled this trick on Caesar once before, and Caesar was in no mood for games. He used his consular authority to have Cato arrested on the spot, Shocked senators rose to their feet, declaring that the Senate would be happy to continue debate, in the jailhouse with Cato. After several hours of utter chaos, Caesar relented and just released Cato from prison. Again, Cato never became consul, but look at what he was able to get away with. He ran for consul several times, by the way, but weirdly refused to campaign. He said that if the people really wanted him, his reputation could speak for itself. Apparently, they never wanted him. Now, at last, we're left with only Rome's highest office remaining. Consul. Stay tuned, because this next one's gonna be a doozy.